Thanks so much for, for the privilege of being part of this panel. And uh, uh, thank you for those who worked to plan it. I'm really looking forward to hearing the other speakers. So we're going to talk about uh, my reflections looking back uh, on things I, I wished I might have learned at an earlier stage of my journey. Uh, my only disclosure is that when you hear old guys talk, uh, you need to keep in mind Mark Twain's line that the past sometimes remember, but better, remembers better than it ever lived. Uh, so with that caveat, I'm going to use a series of stories from my own experience to outline the principles I'd like to share. Uh, this is something uh, I'm sure as the audience knows, Abraham Lincoln. I used to live in Springfield, Illinois, so everything there was about Abraham Lincoln and story and was one of his ways of uh, teaching and of influencing those around him. So hopefully these stories will resonate for you. One of the first lessons I learned that I really think I greatly underestimated in my training years was the importance of emotional intelligence. And the way this came up in my own journey was the first time I was asked to take on a significant leadership responsibility, uh, it had nothing to do with my skill set. And in fact, I was surprised why I was asked to take on. It was an interim DIO role at the institution I was at at the time, and I hadn't even been a full-fledged program director yet, so I didn't understand the ask, although I was quite excited about the educational opportunity. And the person who was talking to me from the, the administrative side said, well, it's, it's not because we think you know the most about education, it's because we think you can get along with the players involved, and that's what we need most in this interim year. And what that taught me is that if you want to move over the course of your career into roles where you can influence the pathways of others, it won't just be the skills that got you to where you are, but it'll be these skills that involve how we approach com complex situations, social situations, and group problem solving that will make the difference. Many of you are familiar with Daniel Goleman's work that looked at this, probably 20, more than 20 years old now. But he surveyed Fortune 500 CEOs, thinking that he would find that the top performers maybe went to the best business school or had the best pedigree or the highest IQ, none of which turned out to be the case. It was all the features of emotional intelligence that predicted those who performed well in a leadership environment. So that was a lesson I didn't acquire in residency. I think the generation of learners that are out there now are much further ahead on that than my generation was, but I would hold that that up to you as one key lesson. A second I alluded to in what I said this morning, so I won't belabor the story here, but it was the principle that Steve Eubanks shared with me when as a very junior person I was teaching at a Sage's residence course, and he just challenged me, noticing I had a passion in a certain area which was teaching for me, to think about how I might leverage and grow that in parallel to my development as a physician and surgeon so that later in my career, I could pivot or move in directions that would allow me to use that more in an area he could see that I was finding fulfillment. So to think about how to show up fully where you are, not be living for a day or place that's not here yet, but as you do so, be thinking about how do I leverage what I've been blessed to have in a direction that allow me to do interesting things that might attract me more later in my journey. A third lesson, and I'll tell a little clinical story to illustrate this from my experience, is don't shy away from difficult things. In fact, view those as your best opportunity, as the crucible, if you will, for real growth. Uh, one of the situations where I encountered this in my first year in practice was I had a patient referred to me by the leading gastroenterologist at our hospital with colon cancer. I thought this was a great thing. He's trusting me with this patient's care. I'm going to go do a colectomy. And, uh, uh, I got into the OR, and it was a Saturday morning because that was when I could book the case, and my partners were all uh, off, and uh, I do my, I'm doing, this is open era, and I, uh, I'm doing my hand exploration of the abdomen, and the stomach feels an awful lot like a leather bottle. And as I got into the case, I found that this man not only had a right colon cancer, but he had uh, his whole stomach involved with a gastric cancer that neither he nor I knew about. Long story short, after breaking scrub, talking to his wife, doing a good assessment for any evidence of metastatic disease, we ended up doing a total gastrectomy and a right colectomy on that patient. He was an 81-year-old Lithuanian immigrant from World War II era. Long story short, he did very well, and in his gratitude brought me a painting he had done, which hung on my wall till about three months ago, 
when I passed it on to one of my junior residents. The reason I kept it is the painting was a gift from him to help me remember that sometimes unexpected things that are hard are where the biggest things that happen in our lives occur. So learning to lead into hardship and challenge is ways that really do cause growth that we don't learn from things that are easier for us to go through. The fourth story I'd like to tell was my first real original research idea, which I thought was quite brilliant at the time till I talked to Jeff Ponsky, who was my mentor, and realized that he'd figured out that idea 25 years before. Uh, but the idea was, and this is pre-sentinel node mapping, that I could inject lymphangiogram dye submucosally in a colon and maybe pick up clues about lymph node metastases before we operated on a patient. At the time, I thought this was pretty cool and pretty novel. Again, Jeff very nicely helped me realize it wasn't that novel an idea. But I did do some research around it, and I invited a second-year resident at the time to help me with the work. Uh, and we agreed at the outset that the product that came from it uh, I would let her be first author on because I wanted to promote my residence in getting engaged academically. Well, as the project unfolded, several academic pieces came out of it, and we split them up, one of which I took the full lead on, wrote the whole paper, did the full analysis. Again, it had been an idea that had come to me. I mentored her in the lab she, and so forth. She hadn't acquired endoscopy skills yet. So I approached her and I said, hey, maybe we divide up the papers. You know, I know I said that at the beginning, but we've got two or three papers now, and I'll, I'll take the lead on this one. And, and it bothered her, and I could tell it bothered her a lot, and she really felt like I'd made a promise. I talked with my colleagues, and they said, John, this is a no-brainer. No I mean, you should just tell her how it is, and if she doesn't agree, just take her name off everything. Well, I thought about it, and I thought, 20 years from now, what's going to matter to me I, if I see this resident at a meeting, how are we going to feel about each other? And I ended up deciding that the relationship and my integrity were more important than the honor of the order of the authorship. And I gave her full first authorship on all, all the product, including the ones that I had developed. Well, let's fast forward a bit. Nobody reads that paper anymore, and it doesn't matter at all. But you know what became of that young lady? It was her first publication. She's now the head of small bowel transplant at Duke. And her academic career has far eclipsed anything I've ever done. And I'm so proud of her and proud of the fact that when we see each other in a meeting, our glance is one of joy at what she's accomplished and not about the argument we never resolved about who got to write a paper that nobody references anyway. So value relationships. The next principle is just to check your worldview. Are you keeping track of my time, Maria, by the way? Would you let me know if I get too close? I get long-winded sometimes telling stories. So um, I had the opportunity early in my career to go to Africa to help teach. And I met the man shown in the left floor picture on this slide, uh, who is a family doc. And he's in South Sudan in that picture, where he spent much of his career at the time he was in Zambia. And uh, he was the only doc for half a million people. So by anything I knew in Western standards uh, around disparity, he was doing it on steroids, and he had committed his life to this. And I asked him one day how he did it, because it wasn't easy for him or his family. Um, and he clearly had sacrificed things that otherwise would have come to him to do the work he'd chosen to do. And he smiled very genuinely, and he said, it's such a privilege to know that every day when I get up to do my job, I could never do it by myself. I have to rely on other things, specifically, he said, on God. And that's, that gives me a real sense of purpose and fulfillment in life, that I'm not just doing my own thing for my own purposes. He's still doing it today. That's 25 years later. The other people I've shown there, John Tarpley and Adrian Park, are known to some in this audience, helped influence my thinking about the needs uh, of the rest of the world in healthcare. And what I found is that the people that invest the most and with the most consistency in those venues, they have a worldview that's propelling them to do that kind of service. It doesn't just bubble up because you think it'd be cool, at least in any kind of enduring way. Adrian has helped start a group that started residencies in African mission hospitals because the need for training there far eclipses what the academic and government institutions can do. And to give you an idea of what's come from that, one of the graduates of one of those programs, a young surgeon serving in uh, Sierra Leone was on Time, Time, Time Magazine's cover, the man in the center of that picture there. 
with his garb on as one of the Ebola fighters, and became one of the frontline fighters against Ebola in that country. There he is with the mask off, Jerry Brown, his name is. Another young man who I had met in teaching for that group in Africa that was starting these residencies, Martin Salia, who's shown here, actually was the young man you remember, may remember in the news who was doing similar service during Ebola to poor people in Sierra Leone, his native country, after graduating from one of those training programs. And he was the one that got flown to the University of Nebraska when he got Ebola himself and did die. But these people pay a cost to do what they do, and they do it because they have a worldview that informs that. So examine, we need to all examine our worldview and ask what is it propelling me towards or away from that's important in life. Another principle is the principle I learned from Bill Wood, who was chair at Emory. The story here was he observed what happened with young faculty over the course of their careers, and he noticed two trajectories. One was the meteoric rise of the person who was doing everything extremely well right away, often in an almost out of control, hair on fire way, but getting lots of accolades for it. The other was more of a plotter, somebody who every year was accomplishing something, but seem to be managing to keep that rhythm of life we talked about a little bit this morning, a little bit in balance. And his observation was that those latter people were still around 10 years later making the same kind of contributions. But those on that first trajectory, too often something happened, maybe an unethical decision in their research because they were a little bit pressured, maybe a breakdown in their home or family life that cost them a lot. Uh, maybe something that happened in a busy OR day where a patient outcome impacted the future of their career. Uh, so to think about the marathon, not the sprint in our lives. Uh, I talked a little bit about education being the thing that ended up being so meaningful for me. I, when I was a fellow, Jeff Ponsky was my mentor and I was watching him serve as president of a society and run a residency and chair a department and I don't know how many other things Jeff was doing and he still was a good teacher. And I said to him one day, Jeff, how do you do all this? And he gave a one-line answer. He said, don't ever stop spending time with your students. That was his whole answer. That became a real mantra for me in my career path. And to this day, even after I've had some of my, my uh, overseers tell me at different points in my career, don't spend time on that. It's not productive. I need you to do this or that. I've always remembered Jeff's line and not forgetting to spend time with my learners, whatever their needs are remains one of the most fulfilling things I do because of Jeff, Jeff's advice. Um, how am I doing, Maria? Have I gone 50? I'm not, the timer's not. We've only got 30 minutes at the end. Oh, okay, all right. See, I told you not to let the old guy talk too much. So anyway, uh, the next story I'll tell is that we all mess up. And sometimes when we mess up, it's what, the fact that we don't acknowledge it and deal with it that costs us the most. So one time I was making rounds when I was at the Medical College of Georgia, and uh, I had a patient who was doing poorly, and I wrote a stat order. This, this tells you how old I am. I wrote a stat order, and I flagged a chart, and I stuck it in a rack. Um, and the flag was red, and that meant to the ward clerk that the order needed to be taken off right away. I know that's ancient history, it, it, hieroglyphics, okay? So anyway, she, I said, that's a stat order, just wanted you to know I put it there. That was meant to be a courtesy. Well, she said, I'm sorry, we don't take stat orders. So I scratched my head a minute. I said, no, no, I'm sorry, my patient's doing poorly. I do need you to take that off right away. It's a stat order. She said, I'm sorry, we don't take stat orders. Well, I thought she was being passive aggressive with me. So I started to tell her that uh, we were in a hospital and in hospitals we take care of sick patients and it was not, it was a little bit sarcastic. And in, when we take care of sick patients, we sometimes have to do things fast, and I didn't know where she thought she was working, but since she was in a hospital, we needed to do this now. She then explained to me that a memo had recently gone out that we no longer called those things stat orders, and she was simply trying to help me get the terminology right. Well, long story short, I went away and pondered that conversation, having noticed that every head in the nursing station turned in my direction as I reprimanded her. Uh, for that until she explained to me what was going on. And um, a couple days later, I went back to her and I said, 
you know, we see each other every day, but we never talk. And the way I talked to you the other day was not the way I should talk to a colleague. And I should have seen that memo, and it's not your fault that I didn't. And I just want to own that and tell you that I want to have a good relationship going forward. Well, long story short, we talked more and had more days where we enjoyed working together after that than we ever had before. And I learned from that that when we make mistakes, it's what we do with them that translates into the long-term outcome. I won't tell you the other story there in the interest of time. I alluded to this this morning, so I won't belabor it here. I'll just tell you that most of the best things in my life, be they in my family life, who I met to have as a life partner, uh, who, how I got to choose, uh, uh, the, or got the opportunity, it wasn't a choice, to do the fellowship I did because I lost the fellowship opportunity. I wanted to do a pediatrics fellowship. Uh, how I got my first good academic contact with Frank Lewis, who was for many years chair of the Morgan Board of Surgery, which happened because a patient walked into my office. I saw him on my clinic roster and it said gastric cancer. I walked in to the room and I said, I understand you have gastric cancer. How, how did you learn this? Because I didn't see any path report. He said, well, I don't have gastric cancer yet, but I will. And I, I said, I'm sorry, this is like in the early 1990s. He said, yeah, my family's been identified as having this genetic mutation and we all get familial gastric cancer. The family uh, lineage is just being worked out now, but I need to have a, a prophylactic total gastrectomy. Well, I turned out that Frank, who I had never met, was working with the family. This guy just happened to live in where I lived and somehow got my name and walked in. It led to me and Frank meeting each other and me getting one of my first higher impact publications because Frank said, if you'll just take your care of the guy and let us have access to the tissue. So we, he ended, Frank ended up publishing some of this work in the New England Journal. Anyway, that, that I had nothing to do with that. That was a gift. And what I'm trying to say is that many, if not most, of the best things that happen are in our lives aren't things we can take credit for or engineer, and that should put us in a place of humility. And I, I didn't realize that at the start. Another dis disappointment I had earlier in my career was getting into my first job thinking it'll be the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. And I don't mean financially, I just thought after four years of college, four years of med school, five years of residency, one year of fellowship, and four years of a military payback, whatever was at the end of that had to be good. What I didn't realize was that I'd never made a long-term commitment other than to my wife in my whole adult life. It had all been four or five years. And when I woke up in my first seemingly long-term commitment and found that there were problems there that I didn't sniff out in the recruitment process, it really took uh, a bit out of me emotionally. And what I found uh, was that relationships and community, as was talked about this morning by others, are the things that sustain us in those times. And again, leaning into those hardships is how we learn and grow. And having key colleagues uh, who are your supporters, your mentors, people you can go to with the hard things that happen, uh, becomes one of the most important foundations of any kind of sustainable career path. And I pictured there a few of the people that did that for me. So I, I alluded to some of the things on this slide this morning. I'm going to stop there and not repeat them. But if I were to summarize one thing I didn't talk a lot about this morning, it would be uh, the fifth bullet down. Really, I've learned that you take a curricular view of life. And no matter what comes at you every day, including, again, especially some of the things that are challenging, it's a chance to learn and grow. And it's what we do with it that makes a difference. And I don't think I understood that uh, when I finished my training. Thank you again for the privilege of being part of this.